From Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. With workplace mental health becoming a safety prerogative, this is the source of information on psychological injury prevention and health promotion. Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Van Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joel Mitchell. Hello, Joel. It's a sad day in the office today, Jason. A sad, sad day. (sighs) Yeah, it is a little bit sad. Rick, the fish has died. Yeah. Um, Are we any wiser as to how the fish died? Well... No, because it happened while nobody was here. Allegedly. Allegedly, yeah. Yeah. Have we worked out the means? We did not conduct a fish autopsy before we conducted the traditional fish burial ritual. Didn't you do that at Nopsema? Like, do any inspections around dead dead fish? fish? No, no. Because a lot of it was offshore. Um. I mean, the environment inspectors would have, if there had been like an issue of um, environmental damage leading to um, fish deaths, yeah, yeah, then they probably would have needed to look at that. But no, no not okay. something I never had to look at. Yeah. So uh, poor Luke, um, who was poor Rick's Luke. carer, yeah, he has um, moved up. We were talking about it. So he has been killing plants. Mm. He's now killing. Animals. Yeah. Um, what's next? I would rather not think about it. Yeah, hopefully that's as far as he uh, escalates. I, I'd like to think that it's not malicious or intentional. We'd all like to think that, Joel. Yeah, he did a good job of looking very sad. Um, I was I was in the kitchen and when he got into the office and he came in and sort of stood and looked at me for a few seconds and then said, Rick's dead. <laughs> Look, and it was I, very sad. I bought it. I bought it. Um, that mm. he actually felt upset about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. we uh, Unfortunately, it's a four-day weekend um, coming up in Australia. Or it is a four-day weekend for most Australians because they will be taking the Monday yeah, off not us. because it's a public holiday Tuesday. Not us. We've got work to do. We sure do. We've got to keep the economy going. We do. Um, but, yeah, if we decided it wasn't probably best to replace Rick the day before a four-day weekend. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So. Or even just the day before a weekend. Yeah. But we'll, we'll replace Rick. We'll, uh, we'll report back in. We will. We'll let you know, listeners, um, the, the status of the office fish situation. Yeah. So starting on kind of a dark moment, but yeah. there is hope. There is a new fish that will be entering our lives soon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's uh, catching everyone else up, I guess, on the... Uh, well, I mean, the, the other thing is that it's been almost three months since we last recorded a podcast, the two of us, so... We're going to be really rusty today. We are. Yeah. Good thing we've got an awesome guest. Yeah. How's Sh- that for a segue? It's fantastic. Should we invite her in? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'd like to introduce her. She's a practicing clinical psychologist and worked in a range of sectors, including community services, primary care, disability, health, and emergency services. She is the Head of Wellbeing, Safety and Injury Management at St. John WA. Welcome to the podcast, Donna Lawrence. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Now, really great to have you on. Um, We've had to reschedule a couple of times on you, uh, Donna, so glad that we could finally get this in right before you're about to take a week off. Yeah, yeah. That's a good way to end um, end the week and start my annual leave. Yeah, glad you could squeeze us in. (laughs) Uh, so, Donna, what podcast do you like to listen to? Oh, there's a few. Um, I'm a bit of a podcast person on the way to work. Um, I find that that's a good way to start my day. Um, I like to listen to Rethinking by Adam Grant. I think he has some really interesting guest speakers. A bit of Optimism by Simon Sinek. Unlocking Us, Brene Brown. Um, I'm probably saying a bit cliche right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say you've got, uh, yeah, the big all the hits. <laughs> yeah, um, culture by design. Um, enjoying that. And just to remind me that I'm a psychologist, um, I like Where Should We Begin by Esther Carell. I don't, have you heard that one? No. Uh, no. Okay. 
She said a light. Kind of uh, I, uh, yeah, I'm not interested in that sort of psychology. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's a relationship therapist and yeah. um yeah, does some really interesting podcasts on relationships and often um has her clients talk on her podcast as well, which is sometimes a little bit cringeworthy, but entertaining. Yeah. A bit ethically iffy, isn't it? But well, Dr. Phil does it. Well, <laughs> Dr. Phil's a quack. True. <laughs> sue me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't Dr. Phil, please practicing. don't sue. Well, I don't think, don't think he's been practicing for a very long time. Yeah. I think he also doesn't actually have a PhD. So <laughs> there's that. Anyway, Donna, tell us about your professional career, please. Okay, so um, I've had lots of career experiences. Um, started in the finance industry, ended up in HR, where that's made me well. That led me to. A, a career in psychology, that was the thing that wanted me to pursue psychology. Um, thought I wanted to be a school psych until my last year of my degree and then realised I didn't want to be a school psych. Um, ended up in um, psychiatry, so that eventually led to my master's in clinic psych. Then I moved to the US for four years and couldn't work as a psychologist over there, so um, I did executive and leadership and development training, which was lots of fun because that was my, I suppose, my job before I became a psychologist. And um, since I came back from the US, um, worked in community services, um, my psychology career has always had a focus in trauma. Um, but I find ClinPsych a bit of a revolving door. So we're trained to deal with the pointy end of psychology um, I suppose that chronic, severe and persistent mental illness. And I think the longer I've been a psych, the more I um, am of the view that early intervention and prevention is actually really important. I'd rather see people stay well and step in early with intensive support when they need it. So what I do now um, works really well for me from a values perspective. And um, I still work in private practice, which is nice. Um, but, yeah, it's a really nice combination for me. Hmm. So, um, yeah, our, our colleague Alicia does the same thing. So she maintains a one day a week, uh, private practice and then mm. works with us doing the prevention work for the rest of the week. Yeah. Which is what brings her joy. Sure is. Working, <laughs> yeah, working with us, you mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the type of work has something to do with it too, I think. Uh, so Donna, you're currently the head of Wellbank Safety and Injury Management for St. John Ambulance. Mm -hmm. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what that involves? Pretty self, pretty self explanatory, really. So, look after the wellbeing and support area. So, wellbeing and support is a team of multidisciplinary mental health professionals who provide, um, I suppose, early intervention and support um, to our teams across the organisation. So, uh, their work might be support coordination, linking someone in with specialist support if needed. Um, they're there for a supportive conversation. Uh, they do evidence-based mental health and wellbeing education and then they also do a lot of contact with our workforce um, in relation to um, high-impact work that they might um, undertake. Um, and then, you know, provide that support for personal issues as well. So that's the wellbeing and support area. Injury management is um, pretty traditional um, in most workplaces. We look after the people who have been injured at work um, and um, help them navigate the workers' comp system and then also their return to work journey as well. Um, safety we have quite a small safety department at the moment, so managing capacity in the safety department is interesting at times. We're not on the front end with our clipboards doing a tick and flick. Um, our safety team are really around, I suppose, consultation, coaching, mentoring and subject matter expertise around things like risk assessments and incident investigations. Um, we also have the drug and alcohol testing um program in our area, respiratory protection program, which includes quantitative fit testing, um, and also um, the vaccination program as well. So just maintaining um, the vaccination records of our people, which is actually a pretty big thing for a frontline healthcare workforce. 
Wow. Okay, you've said that a few times before. Um, so how big or how many dozens of people are in your team to manage that portfolio of work? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think at last count um, we've got 23 people in that team. Mm. That's um, a fair, fair amount of responsibility they've got. Yeah, yeah. We're pretty broad ranging as well. Yeah, it is. Yeah, but keeps life interesting. It's um, I think our people enjoy the diversity of the work as well. So yeah. Good. So um, just to give listeners an indication of I guess the scale of St John Ambulance. Uh, so it's twenty three people supporting what size population? I think our paid workforce at the moment is sitting at around two thousand people. And um, we've got about three and a half thousand active volunteers across the state. Yeah, and that mm-hmm. is what makes um, you know first responder groups like uh, whether it's fire and emergency uh, or ambulance the uh, yeah the the significant populations of volunteers as well. Mm. So um, yeah, interesting dynamics. And they're a really important part of our workforce. We wouldn't be able to deliver our country ambulance service without them. And um, they also are the people that support our events. So if you go to the football, for example, it would be in our event health services volunteers that are there. Yeah. Mm. So um, there's lots of interesting things we could probably talk to you about. Um, Donna, but what we're really interested in talking with you today about is the approach you've taken to uh, the Employee Assistance Program, which is probably quite different to the way most organisations manage it or or what we would consider to be the standard model of service. Uh, So could you please describe for our listeners what that service looks like at St John? Sure. So our wellbeing and support team, so our wellbeing and support coordinators, play a pretty big role in terms of what would usually happen in a traditional EAP. So they're that first point of contact for our team and can provide that linkage and support that's needed. They're also the people that staff our 24-7 on-call number. So um, there are times when we outsource our on-call, but for the most part, our on-call is handled by our internal team members. So our people know if they make a phone call, chances are they're going to know the person that takes the call on the other end of the phone. So there's a sense of connectedness. The person understands the business, so they will understand what that person, other person on the other end of the phone is talking about. Um, and, you know, that, that, that relationship makes a big difference in terms of being able to support that person. So there's that part of it. Uh, the other part to our EAP is that um, we don't have one provider, so we have service level agreements with um, psychologists in private practice across the state uh, that our people can access. So we've got an externally facing website. Um, our people can go onto that website and have a look at all the providers that um, are approved to provide St John um, psychological support and they can arrange an appointment with one of our what we call external providers. Um, our team can also assist with that. So if our, um, someone rings up and they want to be linked with some someone that specialises in something in particular, for example, um, you know, they might have, be having difficulty, difficulties with sleep or they might be having challenges in a relationship or one of their children needs a service. We've got psychologists that specialise in all of those particular areas. So it's, a, I suppose, quite a bespoke and customised service and that service level agreement we have with our providers um, allows us to maintain a level of governance over the service. So I think that's really helpful as well that our people know that the service they're getting via EAP is um, a quality service. How do they go with um, sort of wait lists and that sort of thing? I guess we see a lot um, coming through from uh, certainly the uh, psychology um, representative groups, I guess, in Australia Mm. talking about uh, wait lists and, and psychologists not being able to um, see clients because of just the backlog that they've got. How does that go um, with this type of an arrangement? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think um, it's an issue, you know, it's a national issue that's not exclusive to, I suppose, our environment in EAP. Um, 
in our service level agreement, um, we've got response time um, arrangements where our providers need to make contact with our people within a certain period of time and then um, any appointments that are booked need to be done within a mutually agreeable time frame. So that helps um, our, us provide a timely service to our people. If our providers are unable, you know, if they close their books, for example, they let us know that and we'll make a note of that on our website so people know not to go to that particular provider because they um, they close their books for the time being. And we've also got certain providers that keep appointments open for our people, which means that if we have an emergency or a sense of urgency around um, accessing an appointment for our people, we can always do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we thought it was really interesting, right, when we heard you talk about this model. So what made you decide to essentially in-house your EAP service um, as compared to using a traditional model? I think this this model started before I started at St John um, and it started um, under the concept of people could ring up and say, hey, I'm seeing this provider, um, can you please pay for my sessions? Um, and that was a really great way to start the process because what it kind of highlighted was that's what our people were looking for. That's what they wanted. They wanted to be able to um, see a provider of their choice rather than going to a standard EAP service. Um, and that worked really well for a while, but then we it became a little bit unruly and we needed to put some governance around it. So... Um, that's how it started and what it's evolved into is a service that, you know, people can go onto the website, look at all of the options that are available to them and choose something that's going to work for them. So choice and control is um, a really um, great part of it and, um, you know, choice and control is what under, underpins trauma-informed practice. So it, it means that um, what we're doing is aligned with our philosophy of having a trauma-informed approach to how we do things in the wellbeing and support space. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and what really interested me when you were talking through your approach uh, the other day uh, was, yeah, how you were able to identify, hey, these are very specific needs due mm-hmm. to um, what people are going to be presenting with due to the nature of their role and what they're exposed to in their role. And so we need specialist psychologists who've got a lot of experience in handling those sort of matters. Um, so it was kind of like you creating the, the skill sets that you needed within your um, psychologist pool, um, within your in-house EAP, let's call it, uh, unless you've got a better name for it. But um, uh, essentially, yeah, you're, you're actually really catering to the needs of your target group rather than an off-the-shelf EAP who might not necessarily have psychologists with the, the right skills or experience. Correct, yeah. It's a great opportunity for us to be able to bespoke the service. Um, when we collect the de-identified data, that data includes um, the reason for people accessing therapy. So it allows us to make sure that we add people into our external provider network that are needed. So sometimes that's geographical um, and sometimes that's a particular area of specialty. So as time goes on, we continue to add providers from different geographical locations or providers that specialise in a particular area. Yeah, amazing. So how much work is involved in actually setting up something like this and then maintaining it as well? Yeah, it, it's really important to consider that. Um, it is quite, like when I mentioned before, people ringing up and just saying, can you, can I see this provider, can you pay for it? Um it's quite labour intensive to manage it. So um, we've got an amazing um, wellbeing and support administrator and her role is to basically look after our external provider network. So all of our external providers have got service level agreements. So maintaining those service level agreements. I um, approve all of the psychologists that come into our network, which means I review their CV and all their relevant um, information, like their insurance and their app for registration, working with children check, all of that sort of thing. Um, and we'll often 
work with the providers depending on the person's level of experience. So if they don't, if they haven't done a lot of work in trauma, for example, I may ask that, hey, can you not allocate anyone who's presenting with trauma to that particular clinician? Um, but they're fine to do other things, e.g. You know, sleep hygiene or relationship issues, for example. Um, so there's that part of it. There is um, processing the invoices that come through, tracking um, the extra sessions requests that we get, monitoring the number of pet sessions that people have, collating all of the demographic data. So um, the demographic form, um, we do pre and post measures. We have a client satisfaction survey. Um, and then at the end of the financial year, we number crunch all of that data as well. Um, so, you know, it's a bit of an evaluation of our service and it allows us um, to monitor what changes or improvements are needed. So it, it is quite labour intensive, um, updating our website to make sure all the information on there is up to date about our providers. So, yeah, it's, um, but it, it works really well. We've done it for a really long time. So I think we're, um, we've got pretty good systems and processes in place. So basically you've got a, an FTE dedicated to just maintaining your network of providers? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like more than one person's job. Yeah. A bit of work in there. Yeah, and it, I suppose different people do different things. So our administrator looks after the administration part of it. Um, I look after the service level agreements, the approval of the psychologist, um, share the responsibility of the extra session requests that we get through, um, and then a couple of people in our team um, collect the, um, the data that the, pro the providers give us. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 you're so, probably right, extra, more than one FTE. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's, it's really unique, right, because uh, most just go, all right, there's EAPs, let's just put out uh, requests for proposals to, you know, three, um, and then, you know, often it's lowest price wins. Mm. But what you've done is really thought about the needs of your workforce and then really made a quite bespoke program to mm. and quality assured that program as well. So Yeah. I think the other thing to add to is we actually pay the market rate for our for the psychology services as well. Um, you know, knowing that a lot of the APs do, um, you know, the, the agreement is generally a lot less. Um, whereas we 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 try and stick with the market rate as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, if that's the thing, right? And I remember I worked on the consulting arm before of an EAP. Uh, and I always felt like, you know, it was just a race to the bottom. You know, mm. there was pressure from clients to keep putting down the cost of the service. And then mm. to what point does, mm. uh, do you still expect a high level of quality service, uh, if you keep pushing down the price? Mm. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I think a lot of EAPs rely on, say, counselors rather than qualified psychologists, uh, because mm. it just doesn't make sense financially to be able to carry that. I don't think we could offer the model that we do unless we were paying the appropriate fee for that service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. always nice to hear clients who are willing to pay uh, for, for good service. Mm -hmm. um, so look, the other thing we wanted to talk to you about today, because um, I, I think your approach to EAP is fascinating and the reason we wanted you to share today was it's the first time we've heard of anyone actually taking that approach and I'm mm -hmm. sure our listeners will be quite fascinated by that and don't be surprised to uh, I know I've really connected you in with, some, with some people who are interested in that, but don't be surprised to be um, reached out to by some other people. Um, but we also wanted to talk about your approach to psychological injury claims. Um, so most companies are having to deal with this historically, you know, psychological injury claims. And mm. it still baffles me that some people or some companies don't seem to have good processes in place uh, like they would, at, or at least as good as what they would for physical injury claims. Mm. So it'd be really nice for um, our listeners, I think, if you could share you know, your approach, which we thought was a very mature and really quite advanced approach compared to what we typically hear. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a pre-claim piece that goes with this. So um, obviously we're an industry that is high-risk industry for trauma. So providing people with that early intervention and that um, early support is really important. So for a, um, I suppose, a trauma-based claim, for example, and not all of our claims are trauma-related. Um, we're like a lot of other industries that have um, psychological injuries with different um, causes or origins. 
But with our um, trauma claims, for example, when I get extra session requests through from our providers, I do monitor them for the reason for the request. And if I notice that the number of sessions being requested is um, high, you know, and I would probably say, you know, if, if the request is sitting at around the 10 to 15 session mark and I know that it's for trauma, our process is de-identified. So I, I don't know who that request is for, but I might go back to the clinician and just say, hey, do you want to have a conversation with the person around whether, um, you know, it would be worth their while submitting a workers' comp claim. We're happy to support them through that process with their consent. I'm happy to contact them and talk them through that or get one of our team to contact them and talk them through it because sometimes um, our external provider service, so our in-house EAP, um, may, may not be the best option for that person once their their session numbers start um, getting a bit higher because it's in isolation. There's no other way to support that person. So right. under the workers' comp system, transitioning that person to the workers' comp system, for example, allows us to provide a wraparound support for that person that's more over it. So, um, you know, that, that's, that is where we may start. Hi, listeners. Jason here. We hope you're enjoying this latest podcast episode. Now, if you're like Joelle, Alicia and myself and enjoy learning from the best, then the Flourish DX Academy is for you. The Academy includes free e-learning courses on the ISO 45003 standard for psychological health and safety at work and associated topics such as how to conduct a psychosocial risk assessment and how to create the business case for psych health and safety. All courses feature high quality videos, downloadable resources, multi-choice questions and a downloadable training certificate on completion. Take your learning to the next level with all Flourish DX Academy courses included within the Flourish DX mobile app. Select podcast episodes from the Psych Health and Safety podcast and sister podcasts from Canada and the USA are also included. Get started with Flourish DX for free at www.flourishdx.com forward slash get hyphen started. That's www.flourishdx.com forward slash get hyphen started. Now back to this episode. But with, with that, yeah, with that, Donna, I think that's um, really important, right? Because, like you say, the EAP is completely de-identified. You don't know. Mm. You know, there's someone who's accessing it for multiple sessions, but you don't know who that person is. Correct. So there's no way that you could actually modify or make accommodations within the workplace for that person unless yep. they are able to identify themselves. Mm. Yeah. So sometimes they are better served by the workers' comp mm. system. So for psychological injury, um, they'll submit their claim and we have a process called the Motivated Minds process and that's something that we developed with our insurer to ensure that that early intervention is provided and um, that treatment approach, you know, a best practice treatment approach for that person. So... Um, for the most part, when someone submits a psych, um, a psych injury claim, they'll be off work for a period of time and we're supportive of them being off work for that period of time. So don't think about work. What you need to do is focus on intensive treatment, focus on your wellness, focus on a holistic wellness plan that takes into consideration all the things that we know um, um, mitigating factors and improving someone's mental health. Do all of that and then we'll talk about a return to work when you're ready. So that person can completely switch off from work and just concentrate on their recovery, which is what they need to do. If they've got that stress and pressure of worrying about work, then they're not necessarily um, going to have um, as quick a recovery as what they could if they weren't worrying about work. It also includes, um, uh, I suppose, it's an independent medical exam um, with an independent psychiatrist, but the purpose behind doing that firstly is for diagnostic purposes, but then also we ask the psychiatrist to comment on the treatment approach as well. So we can make sure when we get that report back that the person is connected in with all of the right supports that they need um, for their treatment. Eventually, we then progress to the return to work process. Um, that, that, that takes a village. So often the line manager is involved in that. 
um, wellbeing and support team might be involved in that, the return to work coordinators involved in that. Sometimes their treat, treating clinicians are involved in that. And often for a psych-related injury, it's a bespoke return to work that's based on the person's needs. Yeah. And what would you say the success of that program is, uh, Donna, with uh, people who've had a psychological injury and you've had to return them back into the workforce? Yeah. Over the last few years, we've had some really great good news stories. Um, you know, often in emergency services when someone, for example, has got um, cumulative PTSD is probably a, a good example where um, it, it was just the standard thing where people would be essentially medically exited um, from from, uh, the organisation, and that's emergency services across the board. Um, We've had some great success stories over the last few years where people with cumulative PTSD have got back to pre-injury duties and successfully as well. So, uh, you know, that's always a really great outcome. When we know that's not going to happen, you know, not letting people sit in the workers' comp system forever. You know, we know how destructive and demoralising that can be for people. So really proactive and targeted about helping that person determine, you know, what what's the best outcome for them within the workers' comp system and helping them progress that through. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's really refreshing to hear this, um, I think, very mature approach to, to workers' compensation and, and particularly psych injury claims, which so often end up being really combative mm. um, between the employee and the employer and often made worse by the insurer. Um, so thank you so much for, for sharing this approach with us. I'm interested to understand how you got to the point that you're at now with that process. Um. It's probably been a bit of a learning journey and over, you know, probably over the last four years, for example, um, determining what works and what doesn't and adjusting the way that we do things, um, you know, what's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and expecting the same result. Um, you know, we're, we're really keen to, um, I suppose, engage in that process of continuous improvement. Um, I think one of the big things is relationship building. So the relationship that we have with um, the injured worker, for example, um, can make all the difference to the outcome of their workers' comp claim and their recovery. So the better the relationship, the more supported that relationship is, the more transparent, the more honest that relationship is, the better the outcome for the person um, involved and I think we've refined our processes over the years to the point and, and could we still improve? Absolutely. I'm sure that there's things that we can do differently. You know, um, the workers' comp system is an imperfect system. It's highly legislated, so that's always a really big challenge. Um, but I think the support, that, that that person feeling genuinely supported in the process um, that person being able to trust the people involved in the process as well is really important. So if I ha- it's, it's qualitative stuff, it's not necessarily data driven. It's the relationship um, that we have with that person and that person trusting and feeling supported. Psychological health and safety. Yeah, and I think that that's such a critical part of it as well is who is that person's contact in like in the injury management team mm. representing the organisation and what, what's the kind of language that they're using in, in their communications with the employee mm. while they're away from work and, you know, is it, um, I guess, that sort of business double speak type language or is it genuine, you know, human connection type mm. language and, you know, I guess the way that that affects the perception of the employee on the outside of that um, or sitting outside of that process sort of waiting to be ready to come back to work can can have such an impact as well on um, the way that they're thinking about work and potentially, um, you know, escalating anxiety or or whatever that might be that that goes along with that. I think um, the the role of that, their contact in, in... the um, employer's organisation is really significant. 
Absolutely. And the, um, the person in our team who manages our psych-related injuries um, has a psychology background. She's a very experienced um, injury management person. She looks after all of our psychological injuries. So um, there's one point of contact. The person's not having to deal with multiple people. Um, we're a small enough organisation as well that... Um, it's easy for us to keep that connection with somebody. And I think, you know, I've probably been in the organisation long enough now too that um, you, you just generally know people, you know, you, might, you build relationships. So then if that person does experience a period of distress or difficulty, it's easier to make that connection and support that person because they already know you. Mm. So, Donna, would you have any commentary then on the benefits for injured workers in your approach versus, I guess, more of a traditional workers' compensation uh, approach? Um, yeah, I, I think the benefits are that relationship building piece. It's a really, really important part of the process and we can have processes and systems and stri uh, procedures in place, um, but the relationship that you have with somebody um, can make a huge difference to a person's recovery. Whether it's a physical injury or a psychological injury, I think um, that relationship-based person-centred approach um, to um, managing you know, injury management, I think, is beneficial. Yeah, and I'm not sure if you can share on the on the podcast today, Donna. Um, maybe it's suffice to say that we know the median time now for a psychological injury, um, looking at Safe Work Australia compensation um, statistics, is just over half a year off work. So 26.6 mm. weeks, I think, was the, was the median. Um, and yours is significantly better in that mm. from memory. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you want to quote a figure, but um, obviously what you're doing is, is uh, working in that. You know, people aren't having to spend as much time off work. People are going to get psychologically injured. We have to understand that, um, mm. particularly in first responder work groups, right? Um, but what can we do to, first of all, minimise that? Um, but then if, you know, it does happen, what are the ways that we're able to fast-track their recovery and get them back to work? Yeah, sure. Um, I think from our perspective, we know for the most part for a psych-related injury that has um, a PTSD diagnosis. Um, I'm not talking about other types of psych-related injuries, but a psych-related injury with a PTSD diagnosis, for the most part, that person's going to be off for four months. You know, So we, we don't even, for the most part, think about a return to work at any point within that, four, that first four months. You know, we just want that person to focus on um, their treatment and their recovery and their wellness um, and engaging in things like an exercise program and good quality therapy and time with their family and all of those things that we know can make a difference to somebody. And then we look at the return to work. So whilst they might have that initial period of time off that might sound a bit scary for some people, when you're not pressuring someone into engaging in a graduated return to work program, um, and that's a little bit tricky for us too, um, you know, there, there's not a lot of alternative things that people can do. Um, and even things like putting on a uniform can be a trigger for some people. When you're allowing them to spend that first four months on recovery, you actually get them back to work quicker in the end, you know, that... Go away, do what you need to do, and we'll see you in a couple of months. And then, um, you know, it's often a much more successful return, graduated return to work after that period. Yeah, and do you set that expectation with injured workers from the outset if they've got a PS, PTSD diagnosis that, you know, we want you to focus on this for the next four months before we start talking about return to work? We don't necessarily designate a time frame mm. um, because um, it's a medically driven system. And um, I think with um, psychological injuries, you need to take an individual approach. You know, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. So mm. it's very very much driven by um, what the treating practitioners think um, would be beneficial for that person, and we do work closely with the treating practitioners. Um, but we do certainly focus on you, your job right now is to recover and get well. Yep. Yeah, well, uh, even four months, right, for um, PTSD, 
um, compared to the median of all psychological injuries in Australia is still pretty bloody good. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So can you comment on the cost of business um, of approaching your site claims in this this way? Um, the cost to the business um, is is probably significant you know if you if you think of all the things that you take into consideration with someone being off work for four months so um, it's the wages payments it's the um, cost of treatment um, it's the indirect cost so that person not being at work um, and we know that um, ambulance services across Australia are struggling with recruitment and um, being at full establishment and then you add ramping into the mix and things like that. So having people off work um, does make a really big difference. But what I would say is we do manage the cost of our claims in a very strategic and targeted way. So um, whilst it might be an initial cost that seems a bit excessive, um, we know that the cost of our site claims um, is lower than would it, what it would be if we let it um, drag on. So, you know, getting that person back to work if they're, if they're able to. Um, and if they're not able to, being really timely about, okay, where to from here for this person? Yeah. And, and that could be, um, you know, um, a settlement. Mm. Yeah. And I, I guess, yeah, it's sort of, well, yeah, these are the cost to the business, but, you know, what's the alternative? And, then, mm. you know, if we're returning people too soon or if we're sort of um, pressuring people to return before they're ready, um, then you just get um, sort of relapsing and, and that sort of thing that then, you know, it might be a new claim, but then it's it's still additional costs and mm. um, morale issues and probably turnover issues and all of those sorts of things as well. Yeah. So um, it's not, I guess, yeah, the comparison isn't with, well, what if we had no injuries, but what if we managed injuries in a different way? Yeah. And yeah. I think, Jason, Jason, you're right that, um, you know, site-related injuries are a reality in the first responder space because of the nature of the work. So um, the more refined and sophisticated your processes can be, um, the better it is for the worker and for the organisation. Yeah. Even the EAP process that you were talking through before, um, where you're like being able to see people who are repeatedly using the service, right, uh, for, say, exposure to trauma, mm. um, being able to identify those people if they're willing to identify themselves and go through workers' compensation, you actively encouraging that mm. to be able to put the scaffolding around, um, you know, it's going to be, like you say, we, you can't afford in a uh, market at the moment where you just don't have enough people to do the job um, and be at full capacity. Um, you can't afford people to do themselves even further injury by, you know, getting treated for trauma but not actually accommodating them or, you know, um, putting the scaffolding around to protect them uh, mm. in the workplace. Yeah. Um, so there's, yeah, so many, like, this is why we wanted you on, Donna. There's just so many cool things that you're doing in, in, in those spaces that um, I think our listeners can learn a lot from. Thank you. I think the other thing too is that um, we have presumptive legislation in Western Australia for um, PTSD for um, paramedics. So, um, you know, that, that that's also a great thing as well, that um, people have that safety net of knowing that um, if they have experienced um, trauma, that there's this agreement that we accept that um, this trauma happened to you at work. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cause it, you know, those that already have, um, say PTSD due to trauma exposure, you know, we talk about trauma informed investigation, right? Mm. You know, the last thing they want to do is continue to talk about, you know, how they, uh, all, all the trauma that they're experiencing, right? That led to the uh, PTSD. So, mm. um, yeah, it's great that they're able to just go, yeah, we, we accept that it happened in the line of work and we're going to support you. Mm. Yeah. I think overall our approach, um, is the right thing to do. Like if mm. you look at it from an ethical and a moral perspective, um, how we approach it um, is the right thing to do by people. Yeah, and um, it was actually um, Liam from ACTU. Mm. Um, Liam, you, you, come on, help me out, Joel. Look, it's, what is it, 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, Jason? Um, yeah. Anyway. 
uh, he was saying oh, the same thing. Get that back was, to me at midnight because that's when I'll remember it. It's great that paramedics have that presumptive le- legislation, but yeah, he's advocating for yeah workers' compensation. Liam O'Brien. Liam O'Brien. Thank you. Liam is terrific, uh, but he's um, advocating for workers' compensation uh, insurance reform um, for that presumptive legislation for all you know working Australians and not just mm. those in first responder populations, mm. um, because I think we can understand the benefits right when we um, give people the the support they need when they need it and not, you know, taking the time to argue about, you know, whose fault was it? Was it something that was, you know, you brought into the workplace rather than did work cause it? In all of that time, then the issues can get worse and you end up with a longer absence or the person um, being medically terminated from the, from the role. So, mm. yeah. yeah, I mean, if we, mm. you know, we did that episode on the, the cause of case mm. and that was 10 years before that claim was actually resolved in the High Court. Yeah, and you would think that would have a dramatic impact on her mental health having to live, relive that for 10 years. Yeah, her life. Mm. And, I mean, yeah, if we want to look at sort of from a macroeconomic yeah. perspective, um, we have whatever volume of the population who are experiencing those types of, of mm. responses when they are injured from work, um, what impact does that have on the economy? That's right. If we want to be very um, clinical, or well, not clinical is the wrong word, but... The Cold about it. <laughs> yeah. cool. Well, Donna, it's been a, a fascinating conversation with you and I'm sure our listeners have gotten a lot out of it. Uh, but one of the questions we like to ask all of our guests on the podcast is um, if you were to think about the future, uh, what would your hopes for the future of workplace mental health be? I would love to see less people being psychologically injured at work. That would be um, one of my wishes. Um I would like to see us get better at helping people transition out of the workforce. So um, I think the, the supports that we provide people as they leave, um, that's probably, you know, an area for us to focus on and improve on. Um, and I think as we evolve, and this is the work that you do in your space, um, that primary prevention space is really important. You know, I think um, we need to be- evolve and become more sophisticated around how we look at the the structure and the systems that exist within organisations that potentially prevent psychological injuries. Here, here. We'd love mm. to see that. <laughs> we would. We would. Um, so do you have any parting words of advice for listeners who want to work in the area of psych health and safety? Um, it's a really great space to work in and you can work in this space with lots of different qualifications. So I think that's what's great about um, the multidisciplinary aspect of what we do um, creates diversity in the space and I think that's where that creativity and innovation comes from. And I think, um, you know, there, there's lots of opportunities for people to work in the um I suppose the work health and safety space, it's a really exciting area to work. Fantastic. Actually, um, while I remember Donna, I did see that Carlo Kapanekia from University of New South Wales posted the other day um, saying that they're putting together a qualification, a short course on psychological or psychosocial risk management, I should say. Mm. Uh, and that is a common request from listeners of the show. Where can I get some qualifications? And like you said, they could have any background. It might be in health and safety. It might be in uh, allied health, you know, um, but it doesn't matter where you're coming from if there's some kind of um, thing that you can bridge the gap between mm. your background and what you need to understand to practice psychosocial risk management, uh, I think that would be really well received. So I um, don't know when this episode is going to come out, but maybe reach out to Carla Kapanek here over LinkedIn if you're interested in finding out more about that course and, um, yeah, getting involved in psycho and safety. Mm. Well, um, Donna, that brings us to the end of the show. So thank you so much uh, for your time. Um, and I know you've got a week ahead of you off. So uh, thank you so much and uh, really hope you enjoy your, your holiday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and um, thank you for having me. It's been fun. Yeah, I told you it would be easy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice one. Um, so, listeners, don't forget, we uh, do record these over video when we have our guests on. So if you would like to take out on the video version of Flourish DX's podcast, um, you can do that on the Flourish DX YouTube page. Um, we also take clips from these, uh, these guest interviews and we put them on the Flourish DX uh, LinkedIn page. And... Uh, on LinkedIn, you'll find Joel and I are there all the time. Um, we get told off by Dan all the time for being on LinkedIn too much. Um, Dan. 
Yeah. Um, but you'll find us there. So if you want to reach out over LinkedIn, that's probably a good place to get in touch. So thank you, everyone. We'll catch you next episode. You've been listening to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. To stay up to date with the latest on psychological injury prevention, follow Flourish DX on LinkedIn and subscribe to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast at www.psychhealthandsafety.com.